One of the exciting things about a conference like this is, is judging the audience, not just by the size of those people who are still here, um, but also the diversity of the crowd. Um, you know, we've got students in the, you know, in the program um, who are here. We've got faculty who are here, both um, in the audience as well as, um, you know, who have been speaking, um, and we're delighted to engage them. But the industry is represented by such a broad range of, of folks in the room, um, and I think that that's telling of, you know, of the subject. You know, the subject matter as a whole, you know, technology is easy and we're going to get around to, you know, how to sell tech, I'm sorry, how to adopt to technology in, a, in the most effective way. Um, this is, you know, for a technology symposium, this is the most technology intensive panel that we have um, today, which is one of the unique elements of it. Um, and we're going to hear some pretty interesting facets of that. But to think about an audience that has people in the facilities management, um, you know, uh, position or roles, you know, in their respective companies and companies who, you know, are consultants, you know, on a broad range of levels. We've got a rating agency, you know, representation. We've got lawyers in the room. We've got finance people in the room. It's a pretty um, excited, um, excitable uh, thought when you put together all of the players that it takes to be able to deliver on any of the projects. You know, as Kip was talking about earlier, you know, it's all about getting it done. Well, all of the pieces it takes to get it done is more than him motivating us all to work, um, you know, and, and ensuring that we can communicate, collaborate, and execute, right? So it's all of the other disciplines that go into that, both in the pre-construction um, world, in the pre-design world, and all of that communication and collaboration to bring that to life so that we get around to, you know, the very physical, tangible um, practice of building stuff, getting it done, as Kip said um, earlier. So we are going to lean in here a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about um, a few apps, right? So, you know, the big question or the, you know, sort of tagline for a while was there was, there's an app for that. Technology has to, um, that addresses a pressing issue has a chance. If it doesn't, it just doesn't matter. It's not relevant. Nobody's sitting up on the panel today, you know, who's involved with an irrelevant uh, technology. And we're going to ask you to talk a little bit about how to, you know, how to bring that to life, um, whether it's financing that um, or figuring out a way to, to fund the development and growth of that um, or actually implementing that where you have to, you know, face cu actual customers or clients, um, which is sometimes a daunting challenge in and of itself. Um, so we're going to we're going to jump in and, you know, and and try and flush out a little bit about where and how you've been successful in getting humans to adopt your technology. In a, in a world that is seen as, you know, oftentimes is very con conservative, but as has been mentioned earlier, you know, construction is, you know, is nothing if not a local sport, right? I mean, there's nothing virtual about a hammer. There's nothing virtual about a road grader, and, you know, and moving dirt on a, you know, on a job site. And so one of the things we want to do is to not lose sight of that and figure out how it is that technologies can enable or foster greater performance, you know, and, and so, um, you know, so we'll be talking through that. And it will have impacts on a lot of um, aspects of the, uh, you know, of a project. You know, so earlier, um, Christopher um, from Shop Architects mentioned, you know, he described the digital model as an organic device. You know, nothing could be more descriptive of, you know, this fourth generation or fourth wave of the industrial revolution, you know, that we're, you know, that we're dealing with now. This merging of the physical, um, the biological, and the digital worlds. Um, and so we'll get to talk a little bit about that because we have technologies, you know, that will help out. We have robotics, you know, and we can talk about how much they're a part of the safety equation on a job site or autonomous vehicles. You know, can they report, perform those repetitive tasks uh, more efficiently? Um, you know, talk a little bit about managing a schedule. You know, we talk oftentimes in our construction um, administration classes about managing that golden triangle of efficiency in terms of time, um, schedule, cost, budget, and quality. And, you know, everything that we've been hearing today is all about trying to push hard on one side of that triangle. And the, and the key that I think that Kip was trying to get across, and certainly Denise brought that up in her earlier, earlier parts of the conversation this morning, are all about optimizing that, that relationship, again, between time and budget and quality, right? So we're gonna get into that and, and have to work through that, because the technology industry and the building industry have been here before. We've collided before. We heard a couple of references about, you know, some of the now mature technologies that are de facto standards, um, you know, took 20 years to get to where they are now. 
right? And so, you know, back in the, you know, at the waning days of the dot-com era, you know, the real estate industry, the, the building parts of the real estate industry finally tried to take on some of the technology that we're now talking about are mainstream. That was a very different experience then, right? And so we had a lot of people who were running around selling technologies that were in essence solutions looking for a problem, right? And that's one of the things that our panelists today are gonna help us dispel the myth of where we are in that context now. Um, because I think we've moved, we've moved along that, uh, that continuum quite, uh, you know, quite a bit. So let's dig in. We're going to hear first from James Swanston, CEO of Voyage Control, um, and how to deliver efficiencies through the logistics and supply chain. Right? And then we'll work our way down, and then I'll come back, and, uh, and we'll kick off from, um, from there. Um, Mayor of Oren is a CEO, um, self-described nonconformist, which should have her fit into this room uh, quite nicely, um, co-founder of Versatile uh, Natures, um, and maybe we might even get a, a life lesson from Winnie the Pooh. Um, stand by for that. Um, Rafi Holzer, um, next, um, CEO of Avir, uh, will share his views on the scans of the as-built conditions um, and, help and how they help monitor progress with respect to schedule, including real-world examples um, you know, of that. Uh, um, Christopher from Procore is going to um, share with us a little bit how the Procore team is helping change the pace of adoption um, of technologies and technologies of import. Um, and that's coming at a good time um, with a number of things that are happening in the commercial real estate technology space. Um, and thanks to all of those of you who are here, even though you're you know, going to be in Brooklyn the rest of the day tomorrow, um, for the other half of, of that uh, conversation. Tessa Lau, um, CEO of Dusty Robotics, is going to share with us um, a little bit about how auto automation is narrowing the gap between what's designed and what's built. Um, ultimately, you know, that's, that's one of those, the video that we're not showing is a, is a compelling addition of that. So we'll get to have you, um, ask you to describe that um, and, uh, and see where we go from there. Um, and then KP Reddy, uh, founder of Shadow Ventures, is going to showcase some of the highlights of technology um, in, from the perspective of the investment um, community. Um, so, you know, applying that lens, following the money, um, could easily have been a, a way to tie together some of the earlier panels. Um, so, KP, no pressure on you, but you're going to get to sort of boil this all down for us. Um, money, money helps drive relevance oftentimes um, in, in lots of ways, that were, as were described earlier, depending on your perspective as either the owner or the, um, or the technology provider or one of the service providers in between. All right. So, so that's the conversation we're going to try and dig into and, um, and, and help drive a little bit of the so what factor of all that you've gotten to hear so far today. Um, because a, a theme that when we were trying to organize the conference was how do we help enable the adoption of technology? Not for the sake of technology, because I'm hope, I hope that we've heard so far that technology for its sake isn't really all that relevant. Um, but how do we drive it to adoption in the context of providing solutions that matter you know, on the job site? Um, so this is a general question for, for everyone to, you know, to start with. Um, and that is, you know, what, what's the pain point that you're each solving for? Each of you have an offering. Um, what's the pain point that you're each um, solving for and looking to address? And we'll, if you don't mind, this time we'll, we'll go right down the line, starting with James. Uh, cool. G'day, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can understand the Aussie uh, accent. Um, so the pain point we're trying to um, assist is um, with the logistics um, and deliveries for job sites. Um, most people who are on a job site don't know where their stuff is. Um, as an ex-Army officer, logistics is fundamental to um, winning an operation um, and winning a battle. Um, in a construction context, um, failures in logistics means stuff doesn't show up on time, it gets lost, um, things have to get reordered, you're inefficiently using uh, your labour, um, and there's just a general fog of war. Um, so what we do is, is help to support our customers to understand their logistics better. Thank you. Hi, uh, Marav Oren, CEO, proud co-founder of Versatile. Uh, we dropped the Nature's just a couple of days ago. Okay. <laughs> um, Still on the bag. Yeah. Still, yeah. Uh, I believe we help uh, the likes of Kip just cut through the noise, make better, though very much gut instinct based decisions, but suddenly you have the data to support it and understand how this plays in the overall. And one of the other elements that I love about what we do and how we approach, I guess, the same productivity graph that was shown earlier. Uh, 
was just seamless technology, the one that you don't need to work for, the one that just gets installed in six seconds and data gets collected over everybody's heads and the outcome is just actionable insights that's delivered on text or easy to digest emails that tells you that you're right because you'll be building with or without us, but what if we could help you know that you're actually right? Hi, uh, Rafi Holzer from Avir. Um, so we actually started, or I started, um, by trying to build a solution that probably wasn't a solution to a problem. It was a solution for solution's sake. And so I kind of learned the hard way to go back and, and do it the other way around. I wanted to build the sci-fi vision that I had of um, a facility management tool that would run on some hologram or 3D virtualization of a building. And I pitched this idea to facility managers, and they all told me that it was cool in theory. They had seen solutions like that before, but none of them were adoptable because they had a problem. And that problem was none of them had as-built um, plans that they could actually trust. And so I decided to take a step back and solve that problem first. And so that's what we do today. Uh, we take scans of construction sites, compare them to existing plans, identify discrepancies, and automatically update those models. In addition to that, we also now have recognized a lot of our clients have asked us for progress tracking. So we do that too, so that you have better project controls and you can potentially automate payments, which is where we're headed. So. Great, thank you. Awesome, so uh, Chris Langiza with Procore. So uh, we are a platform to really connect everybody in the construction industry. Um, that includes owners, general contractors, subcontractors, even out to risk managers and lenders along the way. Uh, we work with a lot of the partners that are here. Um, so we believe that data is incredibly important. So all of the information, no matter what you're doing, um, should be easily accessible to people where they need it. And a lot of times that's either on a mobile device out in the field um, where the work is actually getting done. So we try and capture all that information into one place, one easy to consume and easy to collaborate platform. Um, and that's what we kind of deliver uh, at Procore. Great. Hi, uh, Tessa Lau, Dusty Robotics. Um, we are building robots that turn design into reality uh, through automating tasks on construction sites. And the reason why we're here is because of all of the things that we heard throughout the day, today, this morning. It's all about building faster, better, cheaper. Uh, those, that's the holy grail everyone wants. Uh, those three things. And robotics delivers all of those things. Uh, our robots are 10 times faster than people. Uh, there are the, the quality that you produce out of robotic automation is much higher than the quality that you get from skilled labor. And obviously cheaper because you know we're facing the skilled labor shortage and to be honest, the wages just seem to be going up and up. And so we believe that robotics is the answer to all of those problems. Uh, we're rolling out uh, with some, some of the customers in this room right here, we're rolling out pilots and I'd love to tell you more. Uh, KP Ready with Shadow Ventures. Um, so the problem we're solving is pretty interesting. We think innovation in this industry, we, we only invest in construction tech and property tech. Uh, we actually believe the best ideas of innovation actually come from people in this room. Uh, unfortunately, there's some kids in a dorm room somewhere inventing the next pizza delivery app, which no one really cares about. Um, so this isn't an industry where you come in as a stranger and say, hey, I've got this great idea and I've never been on a job site, I've never designed a thing. Um, so our model is our, we're on our third fund. Uh, half of our investors are actually from industry. So it's the Thornton Tomasettis of the world and uh, Holt Ventures, people like that are investors and they're active investors. So they help us vet ideas, uh, understand the applicability. You know, can this get adopted? What will be the friction of adoption? Uh, we can't know everything, so we've chosen to have smart investors. The other thing is we help a lot of internally innovated things get commercialized and actually treat them, treat them like a startup. So we find that a lot of large firms have interesting ideas. They have zero idea how to commercialize and run a startup and build a product company. Most of y'all are services companies. It's a totally different business. Um, so we, we've solved the problem because we, like I said, we think the innovation comes from within the industry. Very rarely is it gonna come from outside of the industry. So KP, do you um, look at what you're doing as indirect R&D? You know, we, we heard earlier that, you know, and, and there's lots of statistics about how much we don't um, invest as an industry in our, you know, in our research and development. Um, there's a lot that goes into it by other agencies. You know, if an infrastructure project, you know, there's a federal highway research, you know, initiative, but hardly of the scale that's, you know, that literally changing the world. Is that what you're, is that what you guys are yeah, doing? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at how we invest in R&D, I, I, I disagree that we don't invest in R&D. As long as there's a job number that's billable, 
we invest in R&D, right? So <laughs> we invest in R&D based on a customer's needs. It's not that we're not innovating, right? We, we are innovating, we just need a job number. That's, that's what it takes. Um, so I, I think because we don't allocate costs of R&D, I mean, there's probably not a person in this room that doesn't learn something new on the next project, on the next project, and you apply it. So I think our, the way we account for it maybe that isn't a true indication of what we're actually doing, but it's happening. All right, good. So used to be in the software business, you know, we used to hear all the time, um, and I'll let you guys decide if this is still the case or not. Um, this goes back to, you know, again, the golden triangle, right? You can have it fast, you can have it good, or you can have it cheap, but you can only pick two, right? That was always the challenge, you know, back in the day. Um, where are we now in that? And anybody feel free to, you know, chime in on that. Where, where are we in terms of the maturation of our, um, as an industry, being responsive to a, another industry sector? Well, I'll take that since I actually mentioned that um, when we're talking about Dusty. So, I mean, the thing about robotics is it's really interesting. The reason we got into robotics is because we made the observation early on that construction is such a skilled labor-dominated industry. Um, this is, that's the nature of how we build buildings today. And if you look at that cell phone that you have in your pocket, it was probably assembled by robots in a factory somewhere, and that's how come it's so cheap. And so how do we bring some of that robotic automation to the field where people like HIP are managing huge teams of people to actually assemble very complex buildings, right? And the only way we're going to be able to do that is through robotic automation, and that gives us the holy trinity of faster, better, cheaper because of all of the advancements that have been coming in robotics in the past couple decades. Yeah, my, my first job as a civil engineer, I was told about this triangle. Um, I don't think it applies anymore. Uh, I think as an industry, like, we're not valued enough, and we fall into, you know, essentially in a services business, you're a labor arbitrage, right? It's all about billability utilization. It's never about value. Um, somehow we missed the meeting that the lawyers and the accountants and all had where they're able to drive 60% gross mar management consultants. I don't even know what they do, um, but they get 60% gross margins, and we weren't invited to that meeting, and we live in the world of 30% gross margins. So I think part of it's how we transform how we think about the deliverable and being a little bit less risk. You know, we're very risk averse, and I think that's where the value that gets diminished is we're not willing to take the risks, and I think technology allows us to de-risk deliver delivery versus just saying, oh no, let me go talk to Steve and have him QA this. It's more, let's apply some algorithms to QA a set of drawings. I think a part of that too is like cheap is a relative term, right? Like so, what are we comparing it to? You know, like you just said, the, the risk side of that is extremely high. I mean, we're talking about projects that are sometimes having billion dollar write downs. Um, $10,000 for a piece of software doesn't sound that expensive when you compare it to a billion dollars worth of risk, right? So I think our appetites have changed significantly on what we think is cheap or expensive on software or technology or investment. I think also, you know, back to the R&D point a bit a little bit, like we, we just didn't track it. I think we were doing a lot of these things. I can't tell you how many factories I visited to see how a curtain wall system went together when I was a construction person. That's R&D. Like, we were trying to figure out if this system was gonna work for this building. We just didn't put it to an R&D budget inside of our organization. So, I think we are investing as an industry more in technology, more in R&D, uh, because we see that the risk that it can offset significantly. Yeah, but I think we're still many times picking the team and the players that we play with through bids, for example. Speaking of cheap, right? Like. How many uh, people here have kids? Uh, try asking them if they will do a bid when they need to pick a team player for their basketball team. Mm -hmm. They will go for the strongest player. They will not ask how much that player costs. And they're puzzled by you know, our world going through bids. You want the best players. You want the best technology. You want the things that will get you executing faster and better, so I agree, the triangle just doesn't work anymore. Okay. So I actually have a, a slightly, I think, different take than maybe some of the people up here. Um, so when we compare this industry to, uh, to lawyers and um, management consultants, um, yeah, I don't know which meeting they were at, I'd love to be part of it. Um, but the problem is here is, is the risk, and I think the better um, uh, uh, comparison is really maybe to the medical industry where you have a tremendous amount of risk and I, I do think frankly that trying I'd like to believe that triangle doesn't hold it being realistic until we achieve a certain level of sophistication with robotics 
it's going to hold to a certain degree, certainly on a relative basis, right? If you want more speed, you're probably going to pay more to a certain extent. It may be le it may hold less than it did, but it still has um, something to say. And, and Mirav, you brought up a good point. You know, when you're picking people for a basketball team, the truth is, right? Kids don't care how much the kid costs because that doesn't it isn't relevant. But I think about drafting. If you know, if you're drafting an NBA team you have scouting reports on how good somebody is and you also know how much they cost. We're missing, for the most part, one side of that equation in this industry. Right? We know how much the bid is, we don't necessarily know the quality that's associated with that bid up front. And while we take learnings internally, project to project, maybe a project manager or a superintendent, I know GCs themselves have trouble spreading those learnings within their organization and certainly you know, with from organization to organization, I don't know if um, the field is learning as fast as it could, as fast as the medical field, for example, learns because they publish papers on their failings. Yeah, Rafi, actually, I, I use the description. We look more like the movie industry. We all just show up to a project, never act like we've never done it before. I've never worked together before. We do something, all the all the learnings get left on this sound stage, and then we leave. And every once in a while, we work with similar actors and directors and all that, but. It's literally, literally, we start from a knowledge level. We start off at, at zero, build up the knowledge, throw it away, and move to the next job. So I've really used the movie industry as more of a how we are messed up. Um, cost is also, um, if we're just talking about financial cost, that also implies that we know what the potential ROI and the savings are. We did um, some work with some of the students here in a capstone project uh, about 18 months ago um, to look at whether major construction firms here in New York knew anything about their actual logistics costs, both the direct and indirect costs. And the number of GCs that knew the answer to that was precisely zero. Um, so it, th there is a real challenge there. And also cost um, is not necessarily just about financial cost, particularly where there are compliance issues or where part of the impact of a technology platform is around safety uh, and stuff like that. So you need to consider that too. Right. So risk risk maybe as a, as a different... Um element of that triangle as opposed to quality then is, is, is maybe a more apt description from what I'm hearing from what everyone's saying because the trade-offs are still there. Um, you know, and the difference between the movie analogy and, the, you know, in the medical industry, you know, certainly risk um, is less about the investment and there's a different measurable risk associated with one than the other. So that's, a, that, that's an interesting take on, uh, you know, an interesting take on that. So as it applies to, you know, to this traditional sector, um, wh where do the humans fit in? How, how do we, how do you engage and, you know, and maybe, Chris, if you'll start a little bit with, you know, your appreciation for or how, you know, Procore is approach, you know, is approaching that, you know, what, what is it about a human-centered model, you know, for, uh, for driving adoption um, or adaptation of technology? Yeah, I mean, if nobody uses your technology, it's a, paperweight to hold the door open, right? So I had a lot of superintendents that when I first handed them an iPad seven, eight years ago, they used it to prop up a chair or prop up a door or, you know, it was great technology, Level but kind of useless, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I think one thing that was missing for a very long time in our industry was um, companies that were willing to help you implement and adopt, right? So you, you mentioned they were selling a solution to a problem that maybe didn't exist and they certainly weren't there in the trenches with you, training your people, um, engaging your folks, you know, making sure that you had support resources at two o'clock in the morning when you were waiting for a delivery and something wasn't working right, right? So I think where we've seen some gains significantly and where Procore has put a lot of focus is we need to make sure that you actually use the tech. We need to make sure that you're well supported in that use of that tech. And then we need to listen to you when you tell us that it doesn't work. That's the other thing that I think was missing for a long time is like we all went and built a product and we're like, this is the best product in the world. And then, you know, superintendent would say, this sucks, it doesn't work the way that I want it to. And we wouldn't listen. We would just keep pushing forward, right? I can't tell you how many apps I, I mean, I've worked with Rafi since I think he was on his iteration of I want to build deck. the yeah, first <laughs> deck. And I, I remember telling him going, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> may want to refocus a little bit, and I'm so glad that he's made it as far as he have because he took the feedback and he listened and he moved forward. Um, so I think that's what's been a big evolution in our industry, and it's not just Procore. It's, it's a lot of the companies that are out there now that are putting so much more of a focus on customer service, customer success, support, um, making sure that the tools actually get implemented, and that's when you can see value. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I think the software industry, Silicon Valley, if you will, has come a long way. Um, you know, software is attractive to investors because it scales so easily, um, but the advice that we get um, from most of our investors today and most of my advisors echo, um, I'll paraphrase Paul Graham, who's the founder of uh, Y Combinator, which is um, especially early, do the things that don't scale. Right, so it, not everything needs to be or should be automated. There needs to be a human to human connection to make these things work. Um, and there are certain parts of what we do today, especially with onboarding, right, to make sure that our system is going to work for the clients we're working with that are manual today, um, and they're going to be manual for probably years to come, and that's fine. There's still you know, value in the process that we automate you know, down the road. Um, but in terms of what we do in terms of setting up the BIM and making sure everything there works and, and our customers are set to go, um, that's still a pretty manual process and I, ex I expect it to be for the long term. Okay. Yeah, but I think that it, speaking of the human element, uh, there are users, right? So if uh, onboarding takes manual work from our users, and I've seen people go like this with their hands, like it took me 12 days to get this into the system. That won't work and that doesn't get adopted, does it? Uh, if you go for things that just happen, and it doesn't matter if we do this manually for as long as it takes, uh, and if we build things that don't scale, they need to scale in the field. And at the end of the day, it's about uh, a superintendent, and I think Kip mentioned uh, the, the age and kind of like the level of expertise. If I start out on a project where uh, a 60-year-old superintendent with you know, way more experience than I have in the field says, I don't know why you're here. And by the time we're done with the project, he says that he will never work on a project without us again. Then, you know, technology has enabled something that wasn't there before. And that's human to human connection. We don't do that through data gathering for the sakes of data gathering or creating a gadget for the sakes of creating a gadget. It's either extremely usable and provides value pretty much all the way from the field professionals to anyone in the office, or it doesn't have a right to exist, and it's down to people. So, Tessa, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Because you're, you're in a humanless solution, We're in not, a sense. We're not, actually. But, <laughs> but. I was actually going to just jump in there because, you know, the thing is, it, you know, humans are our users, right? But it's it's... Whenever you talk about robotics, a lot of people think that robots are replacing people. And that is so far from the truth because what we're actually doing uh, is we're augmenting people by giving them superpowers. Um, and actually, I think this could, this might even help with the skilled labor shortage. You know, what if the new people coming into this industry at, you know, straight out of high school or whatever, um, instead of looking forward to a career in the dirt on their hands and knees, they're looking forward to careers as robot operators. Um, our robot is operated by a PlayStation joystick. It's great for those millennials who love to play video games. Um, and what we're doing is we're enabling them to do way more work, uh, way better, way faster, better, cheaper than a person can do in the same situation. And so they're leveling up in their skill set through robotics. So this is more um, this is more Iron Man than Rise of the Machines. Totally. <laughs> All right. Good. Yeah. Had to throw in a movie metaphor for you, K KP. Please. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a company we started and. Uh, robotics company, it's actually um, a robot that makes clothes. And so I had to take a lot of questions from the press saying, hey, you're going to replace people with robots. Um, and what about all those jobs in Vietnam and India um, of people that make a living by making those $5 t-shirts for everybody in the room? And I was like, oh, you mean the children. So we're going to replace children making these $5 t-shirts. And they're like, well, yeah, those children have to work to provide for their family. And, and you start having these absurd conversations about people replacing, being replaced by robots. And I said, let's just start with the assumption. Let's be clear. The mission is to replace the people from doing menial tasks that can be done. And hopefully, it frees them up to do something else. And I'd visit China. And they said, you know, we have our own millennials in China. They don't want to work in factories either. They want to be sport esports people. They, wanna, they have other aspirations. And I think you have to have a mission to replace people from the tasks that can be automated. And I think in our industry, one of the things, you know, there's a, everyone in this room is solving a problem every day, but they need to take a step back and say, okay, what's the broader picture of what you're solving? Not this project-based problem you're solving. How am I, so, what, what am I doing to take, you know, to solve bigger problems? And how do I apply this learning to the next thing? And so 
you know, I give these talks and people say, well, what's the, what are you telling your kids? And I'm like, tell them, teach them to be good artists because hopefully they won't have to do all the things that they'd have to do today, that a robot will be doing it. Um, and I think it's important that we, we should be striving to replace people from dangerous, hard tasks like sewing clothes or on a job site. We should be looking to do that. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. No one, I don't know, I think you shouldn't be apologetic about it. Yeah, I want to jump in there on the safety issue because I know that that's, that's coming up. Um, yeah, the cool thing about robots is that they can go places where people can't, right? There, there's a lot of situations on job sites where it's, it's blocked off because you don't want someone getting hurt. Well, much better to have a robot get hurt than a person, and you can get the job done at the same time. Yeah, my first job out of college, I, got, I showed up with a suit as a civil engineer thinking I was going to stay in a suit, and they're like, put your boots on and go out to the field. And I had to go inspect caissons, 106 feet in the in the hole in the ground. I'm like, why are we doing it? Like what I went to college. Why are you putting me in a hole? And I had to go down to the bottom of this hole and put w rubber boots on. And of course they they fill with water while you're in them. So they're you know the guy the old guy up top tells you like be sure you wear rubber boots two sizes too big because you might have to leave them in there when we yank you up. Um, and I look at that and I'm like it's absurd. Like it, I mean I hate it. I, in hindsight I love that I got those experiences but it's absurd that we're still sending people down to inspect caissons and not doing it a different way. And I asked my friends that are still in engineering, I'm like, are we still doing that? They're like, oh yeah, we're still doing that. Yeah, for, for me it was bridges <laughs> and culverts. I had to crawl inside of them and you know check the concrete for soundness, yeah. But I mean, yeah, it's amazing. Like the places we could put robots like that, that you know, now we can do things with drones and we're talking about you know rover type style robots now where they're great at data collection. That's where we're gonna see them first and then Layouts a very logical extension, and then eventually we're going to start seeing them put in work in place too. The, Im those. the impediments to that happening, um, that kind of work being replaced, I found because that was a potential thing that we would have worked on, um, was not people in this room. It wasn't the owners, it wasn't the general contractors, the engineers. It, it was government. Um, you know, local law 11, for example, in New York City today is the lo is the ordinance that requires the inspection of facades. And um, there are lots of companies that would like to do that using photography. Um, but you can't because the law requires that you be a arm's breadth away from the wall while you're doing the inspection, which is ridiculous. Um, we spend $10 billion a year on bridge inspections uh, in this country. And those bridge inspections also need to be done, the, the law, the one law copy the other, an arm's breadth away. So you can't take even a telephoto lens, forget a drone, around the bridge to do the inspection. Um, so I don't know if there are uh, lawmakers in the room, but... Law lawyers maybe, but I'm not sure we have any uh, <laughs> elected officials. That's where the fault T may lie. Tessa, maybe following up on that, you know, it, the state of robotics where we are today, uh, where, th where that industry um, sector is today, m sweet spot more in safety or in repetitive tasks? And will there be a change anytime soon in one or the other? I think it's all of the above. Right, you know the the benefits of robotics are so huge that um, you know obviously we're in it to to capitalize on some of that, but because um, the, the things that are happening in the robotics industry just more broadly is that if you look at that cell phone in your pocket, uh, the economies of scale of pulling all of those components together in one place for a really cheap price has enabled a lot of robotics, and and that's what's enabling robots to be built today, and and getting them out onto construction sites. And it's, uh, you know, the advantages are safety, it's about reliability, it's about automating the drudgerous tasks that no one wants to do and dangerous tasks. Dull, dirty, dangerous are the three Ds of robotics. Um, but I think in the construction industry, the safety one, I would add as a fourth, because that is something that you don't necessarily see in a lot of other industries, but it's, it's one which actually makes the construction industry a really good fit for robotics. And earlier we heard, um, you know, a little bit about, um, the, you know, visiting, I think from KPF, you know, visiting the aerospace companies and the automotive companies and, and getting some insights as to how they've used some of the technologies that, you know, that have enabled. Were, was that a part of your development process at all? I mean, the, certainly automation has had a significant role in Detroit amongst other th places and certainly has, you know, in the greater, in the greater Seattle area. Does that um, apply for you as well? It, you know, are those are those places you've drawn upon to be able to develop the robotics that you have? Absolutely. So um, one of the challenges in bringing robotics to a complex industry like construction is trying to figure out where it's applicable. 
Um, factories are great because they're pretty repetitive, right? You're, you're building the same product over and over again, and so you can set up this automated factory robotics automation line that just does the same motions over and over again. And on a construction site, you can't do that because it changes from day to day, from minute to minute. It's a different site. And so a lot of the robotics that have been deployed have been in that very limited scope where it, a robot is just repetitively doing the same thing over and over again. Um, so what, we're, what we've identified is a, a space where robots can actually work on a site. Uh, so our, our robot does layout automation. It, it operates first thing after a, a fresh concrete pour, and it lays out the building plans, the BIM, directly on that, on that surface. Um, and that is one of the more predictable uh, environments on a job site, and it's one of the more critical path tasks. I, th I think it's important too, a lot of the things that we compare, you know, we live in a time of great impermanence. We get an update on our phone every day, we get new phones every six months, but ev what everybody does in this room is of high permanence, right? You're, you're shaping the planet, literally. And a lot of these techniques and ideas around building something, oh, I'm gonna build a, a phone or whatever, an Xbox, those Xbox end up at Goodwill in three years, right? We don't care about the, the design elements of lasting design, and y'all design and build things that have to last for 50 years or longer, and everyone's custom. So you're looking at a situation where every project is custom, and it's very important, because it's not gonna be replaced. You know, if iPhone messes up in this version, they'll make it up in the next version, right? We don't care because we're gonna throw it away in a couple years. And so I think it, it's important to understand that that is a huge difference in this industry. Uh, and I always find it to be kind of a shame because um, if we talk about manufactured housing and all this stuff, you know, great, we're gonna put people in, you know, shipping containers? Like, that, like, <laughs> what, is, like what, are, what are we doing to humanity? And I don't think there's anybody in this room think, that's interested unless you're just like really trendy, you wanna live in a shipping container. Um, none of us are really interested, but we tell poor people like, hey, we have a house for you, we're gonna put you in a shipping container. Aren't you excited? Um, with a view. A, with a view, like, it's, it's <laughs> like minutes. absurd, right? I mean, it's absurd, and I think we're all better than that, and I think the technology should be an enabler for us to be the better form of ourselves. I I agree, but this is still manufacturing that we're looking at. Even if we don't use shipping containers, so many of the processes are equivalent to manufacturing. And I think we fail our own industry when we don't look at ourselves as a factory. It might be a unique thing that we build. It might be uh, different teams. It's still very much a factory. And if we understand our own processes well enough and we actually benchmark and I think it was, sorry, keep, for, keep referring to you, but I think he mentioned uh, over $4,000 a minute. 4137 was that the right number? Yeah. 73. So Dyslexia kicks in again. Fixed yeah, but why aren't we measuring by the seconds and by the minutes? Why don't we understand where time really goes and price that and understand, truly understand, using actual data, what you know, this process really is about? then start benchmarking against that and raise the bar. I think if we did measure, and I've looked at enough projects and enough data that we've collected so far, it's the same benchmarks as probably 100 years ago if someone did actually take a timer and try to measure how long things really took. And boy, we, we can do better. And we could use the same resources without eliminating the humans from the process to do more and faster. And how about the same superintendent doing the same job on two projects simply because he could do more, not because um, we need to eliminate them from the process. So, so Galbraith and a, and a stopwatch you know, on a job site is a scary proposition, or it's what Kip does every day, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a little bit of both, right? Um, and so the idea is to be able to get access to that data, and one of the places where that data is put directly to use is in scheduling. So James, you talk a little bit maybe about, you know, scheduling and the coordination of logistics and how, again, from a, from a problem-solving perspective, um, you've seen that work maybe in other asset classes or other places around the world. Yeah, so uh, going back to talking about shipping containers. So um, in the Port of Los Angeles, go, okay. well, no, not at all, no. <laughs> um, and, and the time thing. So at the Port of Los Angeles, we move about 100,000 containers uh, every month. Um, so it's about 5 to 10% of all container traffic in the US. Um, it takes, on average, 60 to 70 minutes to move a container in or out of the Port of Los Angeles. Um, only one of the 13 terminals there is automated, the rest are all manual. 
Um, I was in Jebel Ali um, in Dubai recently with a client. Um, it's an automated terminal. They move a container in 10 minutes. So when we think about you know, competitiveness, um, it's not just about you know, robotics and automation. It's about is the industry going to survive? Is it going to be competitive? Um, to move a container in and out of the... Um, uh, two of the ports down south, so in Savannah and Charleston. Um, it's $100 less because it's non-unionised labour. Um, we have clients who are thinking about moving uh, modular construction units from Europe into North America because it's cheaper to do it than to produce it here. So one of the interesting challenges... Uh, yeah, that, that's, but... That's scary. Well, it is. So I was chatting to uh, the head of a very big union uh, last week, um, and because there's interesting challenges in, in the union um, movement here about how to uh, deal with uh, robotics and automation. And the reality is don't try and fight the fact that automation and technology is coming. It's how do you embrace that in the best way and actually transition a team that used to do one thing in, into something else. So, you know, presumably people, you know, 50 years ago had to go through this same challenge about learning how to use typewriters and then use it using computers, it doesn't take away jobs unless you ignore what's going to happen. So a, a great client of ours sort of says you either get on the innovation train or you get run over by it. Um, and that's absolutely the case here. And that will be an autonomous vehicle? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, autonomous vehicles, it, it's an interesting challenge. Like, um, it's, it's very hard for, you know, trucking companies to um, buy new trucks because they don't necessarily have any money. So. Um, so a automation with, with trucking is absolutely going to come, but it's probably not going to happen as quickly as everyone thinks it will. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to follow up a little bit on the data comment, if I have a moment. Please. Um, so one of the things that blew my mind when I first walked onto a construction site is uh, how little data there is, relatively. I mean, unless you're using something like Versatile or Avir, right? You know, do you really know what's going on on your site? There were, there, there's people out there whose job it is to walk the site and report back on what they see. And you know, the interesting thing about ro what robotics brings, it's, it's not just about direct labor automation. Um, it's really about digitization, because robots are digital natives. Um, everything a robot does is reported back up into the cloud. And so you have that record. And so the work that's getting done on the job site, once you start adopting robotics, is no longer going to be done by people and very opaque. Um, it's going to be uh, trackable. It's going to be monitorable. It's going to be analyzable by data analytics. Um, and so that's what I think is, it's, it's hard to measure the value of that right now because we're not really doing enough of that data analysis, but I think that's coming. So Rafi, can I pick up um, with you on that a little bit, Absolutely. you know, in terms of complexity, you know, um, size, scale of a project, does that matter for, you know, for a visualization, you know, approach? Uh, if we want to get technical, yes, it, it does. Um, we've made it, um, you know, we found workarounds, but right now it's hard to visualize, um, uh, a BIM in, you know, if everything is on the cloud right now, right? So you have uh, softwares that some of you may be familiar with, uh, Navisworks, Revit. Uh, they're on the desktop primarily for a reason because you can, um, you know, get on the GPU, the CPU, and you can turn that 10 gigabyte file and, and make it look nice. Harder to do on the internet, um, but that's where everybody wants to be. Um, and techno I'm very confident we're doing things internally and as are many, many other companies that are going to make that uh, possible. What we're worried about from a complexity perspective is not so much um, the visualization, um, because that, that's going to get solved, um, but, um, you know, the data tracking, you know, how much, right. how much data can you track and how much data really can human beings ingest? Um, that ultimately becomes the limiting factor, um, because computers can you know, churn endlessly um, and crunch as many numbers as you'd like them to, and we can now, using parallel computing, really scale that up ad infinitum. Um, the question, you know, one of our first projects we found, so what we do is we create a list of deviations between um, the as-built uh, site and the plans. Uh, on a single floor in a residential building, there were upwards of 1,000. Now, which one of those mattered? Because if I give the superintendent, the foreman, a list of 1,000 elements that are deviated, that's as good as giving them none. Um, so we had to start identifying ways to surface the right ones to the right people at the right time, and I think ultimately that's where um, technology has to provide value, is in making sure that the right information gets into the right hands when it needs to. Uh, I, I gotta jump in on that one, that's so true. I think our first project, we've been so obsessed with just showing 
what we could do in terms of data that we have over flooded our users and are like, okay, stop. Like, we get it. You have a lot of data and you could slice and dice it any way you like. How is that helping me make a better decision in real time right now? And I think my um, entire executive staff is obsessed with how do we create a single button or a single message that actually makes a change rather than over flooding with data. So our back end is probably so much more intense and rich than what will ever show on the front end because that would just be confusing to people. But that said, and building on Tessa's point as well, with everything actually recorded and documented, the ability to understand our own standards and start building from that, if we have the entire portfolio of a GC actually recording data in the exactly same measurements and looking at the same teams or the same different mixture of teams producing you know, similar results or outliers, what can we actually make of that and how can we improve as an industry building on that uh, at the GC level and then on the industry level? I'm, I don't want to get too much time, but the lack of standards within the industry is probably one of the biggest impediments to technology adoption. Software requires standards because the whole point is that it's not customized for every single um, deployment. Um, but what we found is that even within a single GC, right, this project manager and superintendent pairing has their own preferred standards. Um, this VDC team has theirs. Um, the scheduler has theirs. And I think Robbie talked about that and the difference even within Gilbane of having yeah. project managers, you know, who have their own, you know, their own flavor that, uh, you know, that they It's prefer. a very federalized system. Um, you know, it, it really reflects, because it is not completely unique to the United States, but, um, you know, you have a lot of the same issues in regulations within states, townships, and the federal government, you have the same thing uh, playing out within, you know, corporate uh, regions, projects, uh, within general contractors, and uh, it's, it's tricky. So, <laughs> so a quick note, of course, the, you know, our co-producer of this event is the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and you know that the big thing that they're looking for to come out away from a conversation like this is, you know, relative to the workforce, relative to there's a lot of training and development, professional accreditation, but a, a huge part of the discussion is around data and about data standards. Um, and I think we heard a little bit this morning some of the differences that exist even agency to agency, I know they don't like to view themselves as peers, but you know the MTA and the you know and the Port Authority or EDC and the Port Authority, um, you know you start looking at you know at them and they've got their own version of this and and this isn't Sony Betamax versus VHS, you know this is a this is a much bigger play you know when it comes right down to it. Well, how, how do how do you adapt to that? And the then difference. You want to make sure you get a, a voice. Yeah, in this I mean, I, I think that's part of it. Yeah, we'll come right back. Part of it is, as an industry, we have to, like, there have to be standards. But I think what we do is we look at projects and we say, oh, for this project it's special, and so I'm going to go solve for that. I mean, I, early on doing cost estimating and like, oh, let's follow, you know, master format, and then of course the minute we fo follow it, we bastardize it to add some things that are important to us. Instead of really thinking about it and saying, is it that special? Is it that important? Is there a better way to do it? Uh, I just think there has to be a lot more critical thinking kind of around that. We have a company we're funding that's, you know, basically AI engine that's going to read drawings and do scheduling, estimating, all of it um, without any human intervention. And, and if you look at them, we, we walked away from BIM. We said, like, well, BIM is easy if you want to do those things. Standards are drawings and specs. So we'll let the AI engine consume the data like a person would and actually learn, like a true AI engine, constantly learn and constantly be corrected and taught by uh, experienced you know, quantity surveyors. I, I think it's interesting, but I think we're also where technology is going is going away from standards. The idea that you don't have to have every field the same, that you can actually use semantic engines to figure out, um, to, the system can figure it out. So I think. You know, the minute you have too many standards, people, human nature is to, we're still all three-year-olds in our heart, like, you tell me to do something, I'm going to do the opposite. Um, so standards also have the flip side as you, you get too standardized. I mean, NIBs and all have tried to do standards for years, and um, everybody just kind of chuckles, right, because it's not real. Um, it's a great way to go have a free lunch or a free dinner, but nothing actually gets done. So I think there's a, a balance there around... Um, standards and, and I think technology starts to evolve kind of beyond needing highly uh, determined standards. So okay. I, I would agree so with Rafi and then Chris. 
I would agree with uh, what KP said. I think technology is moving uh, past that, but I don't know when we're going to get there. It's kind of like the, the self-driving car thing. We're very optimistic about AI being able to just read a document, uh, read a set of standards, and compare the two. Um, it could be 10 years, and I, I don't want to waste the next 10 years um, waiting for that to happen. Um, it's interesting, you, know, you mentioned VHS versus Betamax, which is a great example. Um, that was able to, ha we were able to settle on a standard um, because there were far fewer stakeholders involved, right? The minute you add a, every stakeholder that's added to a decision that you have to get consensus on um, exponentially increases the, or decreases the likelihood that you'll achieve that consensus. And um, we have hundreds or thousands of stakeholders globally um, who could potentially make this kind of decision. Um, what I ultimately see happening is, in the way this has happened before, if there is a technology that, break, that breaks through that is so friggin' useful, but just requires you to use that one standard, people are just gonna get drawn to it, and that's what's gonna get this thing rolling. I think one thing that's really interesting here, and I'm gonna back KP up on this a little bit, is like the idea of, of standards as like locking down, you must have exactly these fields in this format, I think is getting further and further away. Um, I'm part of a group is, called- Is that because all software engineers are artists in their own mind? <laughs> they want to be able to create their own unique expression? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know too many software engineers that'll be like, I'm an artist, but <laughs> we'll, go, we'll talk about that more later. I have a few I'll uh, introduce you to on that front. Well, so I'm part of a group called the Construction Progress Coalition, and it started off as a group that was trying to literally set standards around how PDFs were created. And it very quickly evolved into how do we exchange information? Um, and then it was like, well, we should have a standard on how we exchange this information. I'm like, wait a minute, I think we've broken the wheel again. We're just right back to where we started. And what was really interesting is as the conversation started to evolve, it was less about standardizing the file format, but more so that like you could actually exchange the, the information amongst people, right? So we talk about- So the notion of an open architecture standard. Yeah, in, exactly. In and, and, and that way people could say, hey, listen, this was collected on a previous system, but we know we can get it into the new system, right? We can take all the information we need and still use it moving forward. Now, there may be some data integrity lost, right? There might be little pieces and parts that don't necessarily work, but the core things that we have, that we absolutely must have on every project, get, get passed on. And I think that's more of the architecture that we're moving toward. I'd like to think that we are. Well, uh, so that we do, you know, we talk about industry labor problem. Our biggest challenge is we have trouble recruiting top talented software engineers. We're not sexy, it's very hard. You know, they'd rather go work somewhere cool um, than work in our industry. And you see it in the products that are out there. You know, things like Semantic and AI, and that's nothing new, it's very old actually. It's just that we can't get people to work in our industry that actually know what, what the hell they're doing. You know, they're not, it, recruiting, you know, and I've, I've been in robotics, like recruiting the top roboticists away from a Boston Dynamics or whatever to say, hey, come do a robotic forklift. Eh, I want to do a robotic dog because we have a shortage of dogs. We need more robotic dogs. <laughs> but um, but Ironically, the first thing they did was launch it on a construction <laughs> site. <laughs> right, and they walk around, you know, so it's, it's interesting. Like, how do you get that, how do we make talent sexy? And I do a lot at Georgia Tech and other universities, and I was like, honestly, if it wasn't for BIM, we would have lost an entire generation from our industry. That is the only kind of sexy thing that's happened in our industry because otherwise the option was gonna be, hey, for the next year you're gonna do, do door and window details for the rest of your life in CAD. And the millennials would have been like, I'm done with that. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna do it. So I think it's important that we, we focus on how do we get people outside of the industry to care about what we're doing and, and draw that, that exponential talent. That was the best advertisement for construction robotics I've heard in a while. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, for construction technology in general. <laughs> so, so is there a, the next Google for construction out there? No. <laughs> don't, don't look at me. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. I had 10 minutes planned for that response. I'm not sure. No, I, no quite does that. I don't, it's interesting you bring that up, because like, I don't think there can be one source of all the data. Like, we have way too many competing. You didn't grow up in an IBM household. Did you? I did not. I yeah. did not. We have way too many competing initiatives, right? So everyone is going to take and put their special sauce on something, and we'll never get to a place where everyone's just like standardizes on and says, hey, I mean, there's probably somebody back in my office going, I can't believe Chris is gonna say that, that's a lot, but that like everybody in the world is always gonna use Procore, right? 
we have to realize that there are different solutions out there that different people are going to use, and then they need to be able to communicate, right? And that's the whole reason we have an open platform, I mean, to be honest with you, is like, we need to have communication between stakeholders, so owner, GC, sub. We need to have communication between point solutions, yeah. so we need to be able to communicate there. Um, I just don't foresee a, a world where there's going to be one and only one, like, that just becomes just Procore it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, th the, rea the reality is the Google for construction is called Google. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that's the reality. Why doesn't Google and Microsoft care about our industry? We're very difficult. Right? If you look at the metrics of technology adoption, change management, um, I, always t I always remind my startups, which we have many, is this is not enterprise selling. The project is the enterprise. The enterprise is not the enterprise. Convincing DPR construction at the C-suite by our technology and adopt it across the board never happens. They're like, oh, let's go try it on this project. And if you look at forecasting revenue on a project basis, which all of you all have to do as being in the industry, it's disinteresting to Microsoft and Google. Google has spent hundreds of millions of dollars like in our market trying different things, and they're just like, not worth the, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. That's also a very US um, thing as well, though. So um, it, it's been interesting. So I started my business in the United Kingdom, um, and there's been a lot of construction tech companies that have completely failed because it takes a long time to get your first couple of construction clients in Europe. Um, whereas in the United States, because it is so fragmented, it's much easier to get lots of clients. However, in Europe, when you can actually show a, a clear technology solution to a big construction company, it's a very, very different um, scenario. Um, partly because they want common standards and because standards is something that is a bit more European um, in some respects. Um, the other reality, though, is it's, a f as sort of Chris said, this is a $15 trillion industry globally. Um, in the freight industry globally, the biggest player here in the United States, uh, C.H. Robinson, um, only has $15 billion in revenue. Um, that's not even 1% of, of the industry. So, um, you know, there's going to be space for tons of different Googles, you know, to, to work in, in this space. Um, so one of the one of the issues that came up before as you're describing, you know, robotics was the and automation in general. You know, in a in a factory in Detroit, you know, the the end product is what's moving through the fixed rotate you know robotic stations or the fixed automation stations. They move around a lot, but it's the assembly line that's fixed. And then a, a point, you know, back to you know that you had raised earlier about the unique element of you know of a building. You know, there's one of them, and it, it, all of the automation is moving around the fixed site. Um, to, how does that play into, you know, into the ability to the uniqueness of it, the data associated with that, you know, the, the project controls? How, how, do those, how do those factors play? So we, we invested in a company called Icon 3D. Uh, Google them. They're really cool. Uh, but it's 3D printed houses with concrete. Um, and we did a $9 million round. It was the largest seed round in the state of Texas. Um, and people are like, wow, but how many single family homes? You know, and I was like, great. Do you understand we're solving a material science problem with concrete? We're solving a controls problem. Like, just the incremental technology problems that we're solving are highly transformative. But the idea that someone can show up to a subdivision, design a custom house on an iPad, and then in 24 hours it gets printed is, is mass customization, right? It's, not, it's automation delivering a custom and unique product every time. And now we're shipping these machines to Haiti and everywhere else. And they just set up on tracks and they literally stamp out a house every 24 hours on a plot of land. You know, is it 100% of the house? No, it's about 90% of the house. And we're solving uh, plumbing and, and air conditioning, like all those other issues. And we're about to do, next year we'll do our first entire subdivision in Austin, Texas, that'll all be 3D printed house. It's, it's $24,000 for these houses. So our idea for affordable housing is, the emotional attachment to having a home that you had a part in designing is high. So when you buy this house, you're likely to, or rent this house, you're likely to stay there for a long time, actually have roots in a community, uh, versus making it and then getting out, right? You maybe stick around a little bit longer. Because if you put people in a shipping container, they want to get out right away. I mean, they're like, anything I can do to move. Um, you know, but I think that's a good example. You shipping containers, right? <laughs> Uh, I just I sit in on these affordable housing conversations, and it's just like, <laughs> yes, let's put people in shipping containers. That makes them feel good. Um, but the idea that robotics and controls and technology, you can deliver mass customization. 
it's going to take time, right? And there are some parameters, and there's, there's a boundary condition around all, everything. But I think you'll continue to see more and more of that, um, which I think is, is pretty transformative. So I want to go back to the, the factory question about robotics. Um, one of the interesting opportunities in robotics in construction, it might take a while to get to this, but if you look at how buildings are built today, the tools and the materials that we handle are made to be handled by people. Like a two by four is the size it is because that's what one person can carry on his shoulder. Um, and once we start bringing robotics onto the job site in order to start doing some of the assembly work and some of the building tasks, we don't, we're not constrained by that. And, and 3D printing is exactly you know, along those lines, right? It's really rethinking what kind of materials, what kind of processes can we use to do building um, that isn't subject to the limitations of what we've seen traditionally throughout this industry. And that's where robotics is really an enabler for what can happen in the future. Yeah, just one quick comment. One of the areas we're tracking very closely is material science. Because we think with all these transformative technologies and robotics, we're stuck in a supply chain of cement. and like We have these standard supply chains. And if you think about it, the material science innovation, there's so much stuff on the shelves that we're not using. Because getting people, I mean, I remember working with aerated concrete. It's like, oh, how are we going to teach the trade person to use aerated concrete? It was like this weird thing. Like, well, if they can't use it, then we'll never do it. If she's got a robot that doesn't care if it's a graphene structure or a steel structure, like whatever, uh, and is integrated into the workflow and the mechanics of the robotic system, there's a massive opportunity for material science that's literally sitting on the shelves. I mean, it's sitting on the shelves at Georgia Pacific and USG and places like that because they had to cater to the human condition in mass manufacturing, whereas technology like, robot like robotics can actually, um, you can fully deploy like new material science. But I I think speaking of manufacturing and data and the fact that it's a different product, uh, we, we need to slightly go back to basics, and I'm a true believer in all of the potential and the technologies that we're all developing, but construction is happening right now, and it will happen with or without us, so it's about understanding what we do right now. What we did uh, early on is just focus on the one tool that could tell us the most about what's actually happening. We zone in on a crane with a multi-sensor approach. So all the data coming from the exact same location, you could throw kind of data uh, points against each other to get for a much more accurate and faster identification of what's happening. Uh, I believe we learn 10, if not 30 times faster than any visual recognition out there. Um, We've done enough uh, picks through the crane to, to actually say that. Uh, and at the same time, I think, you know, so many times we're trying to automate processes we have not yet even totally understood. So what we're doing is helping people make better decisions right now, actually understanding what, you know, to the level of how long things really take, right? Sometimes we just, schedule based on averages and estimates. And you know what? Different pieces take different time. You can't just assume it's 15 minutes across the entire job site and just and go with the, that. Are those averages, you know, work breakdown structure kind of task? You know, this is how we've been doing it, um, you know, for X number of decades. Oh, yeah. um, and all we're doing is trying to beat that as the mark? Yeah, I, I think I see that a lot, right? Like, it's, it's working. We're meeting schedules, like, but you could probably do 10 times your schedule. We need to change how we schedule if we understand our actuals, right? So it's a, kind of, a, a, I guess, a chicken and an egg question right. uh, where it comes to technology in general. Uh, but I'll say if you do actually take the time to understand your own manufacturing, then you produce better scheduling by definition. We've actually run the uh, exercise of looking at uh, actuals versus what was planned and then rerunning the entire schedule, this was a, a prefab, uh, through using actuals only, no kind of restrictions, no complicated assumptions, just looking at actuals and rerunning the entire schedule. Guess what, we got way better results just using that uh, to plan the next project. So, so plan with an outcome in mind, and that is your... As, plan as, with actuals. Yeah, C kind of an interesting approach. Not, not typical of how we... Certainly on the on the complex infrastructure. How know, else projects. do you push the envelope? How do you actually improve on your own 
performance if you don't even measure your own performance. Right, and so James, I'm gonna let you talk about that um, just a moment, and so talk about the, you know, the integration, you know, that, uh, you know, that you guys are so, you know, known for, you know, in terms of logistics and supply chain. Um, but just a quick um, heads up for everyone who's out there, we've got a little over 10 minutes left. Um, we're gonna take the last few minutes of, uh, of the panel to, to entertain your questions. Um, and again, as to the panels before, there'll be two, two of the folks standing around. So fire your questions up. First one's gonna come over here to my front left um, and uh, we'll get going on those and then you'll be second. Um, so James, a, a quick thought on you know, the, this notion of integration as it relates to you know, the supply chain, as it relates to that work breakdown structure. I mean, all of those elements that make this hard. Yeah, I mean, I um, part of, and I'm actually not going to talk about logistics and supply chain in answer to this. So okay. um, I used to be in the Army, um, and my final job working in a national agency um, was all about uh, supporting special forces operations. Um, and the first thing is everyone thinks that the NSA um, and all the satellites above and elsewhere just collect lots of data and they know everything that everyone is doing. Um, the reality is, though, that it's actually all about creating actionable intelligence, you know, getting the crazy amount of data out there and ensuring that someone on the ground can actually deliver particular results, which in our case related to um, dealing with bad guys. So, um, but it doesn't matter whether we're talking about construction, logistics, anything. So it's really about how do you take this vast array of data that's out there and you allow a decision maker to have the right information to make a decision. And part of that, um, and if we think about, or anyone that's read anything about the 9-11 uh, failures, was that a lot of the intelligence um, agencies actually had snippets of information that would have allowed them to do something. Um, but the reality is it was all in silos. Um, some of it for good reason, but the reality is that if you have information in silos, it, you fail with this decision-making thing. Um, and so in the spirit of not talking about logistics or supply chain, um, the final little um, thing that I often talk about when I give speeches is uh, there's this thing called the Boyd, Boyd Cycle, um, and it, it was a US Air Force uh, colonel. Um, I'm normally rude about the Air Force, but this guy had some good ideas. But um, it, it, it's sort of related to this thing called the OODA loop, which is all about uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. And your ability to observe what was going on in a uh, battlefield environment, um, orient towards making a decision, and then acting on that decision was the best way of winning a battle. Um, and that is no different in business than it is to being in the military. The quicker you can make the best decision based on accurate information, you're going to win because ultimately um, survival is not mandatory for construction companies. Um, it's all about you know, winning an information battle. But, but the analog certainly plays, if you were to describe it, you know, first published in 1883 that had something along the lines of communicate, collaborate and execute. Yeah, well, I mean, you can that, go back. That sound familiar? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, taking it a little bit uh, further back in time, one of the great things about living in the UK and, and the road network is a lot of that was actually built by the Roman army um, two and a half thousand years ago. Um, so there's always a very interesting parallel about what happens in the military, um, whether you talk about logistics or engineering and actually the construction industry uh, itself. Right. All right, so we're going to get ready for the questions. One last quick uh, sort of parting thought from, uh, you know, from each of you, and that is, will our so-called conservative nature, and you feel free to argue that if you like, but for the industry, will our conservative nature slow the revolution that's possible down to evolution? Um, and therefore, are we in a position to actually take advantage of a lot of the transformational possibilities that are out there? Uh, I think the companies that um, use technology and engage their workforce, uh, the best will win and those that don't will uh, lose. Okay. Yeah, do, kind of agree to to that point <laughs> completely. Uh, I think the industry as a whole will win, and I don't think that any of the conservative nature can survive the revolution that's already happening. On the on the good side, we're seeing way more adoption than I estimated possible. Maybe a year ago, we launched a year ago on a very soft launch, and I was like, it's going to take months on end to actually get on projects. It was easier, faster, and yielded better results for everyone involved, you know, significantly faster than I imagined. So, um, <clears throat> I think 
No, I don't think the conservative nature is going to disrupt. Uh, but I also think evolution is just fine. Um, I'm an incrementalist by nature. And I think uh, most of the things that we're talking about here are going to ultimately be adopted slowly. And that's probably the way it should be, because you break fewer things. And in a high-risk environment like construction, it's probably the way you want it to be. An incrementalist, a nonconformist, and an optimist walk into a bar. There you go. Yeah. It's, yeah. Sorry, Chris. I, I think what will be really interesting to see is um, things are really good right now. So what's going to happen when they're not? Yeah. Um, and that is either going to accelerate, which is what I think will happen. Um, we look at when we came out of the last downturn, like that accelerated adoption of technology. I think it was a big portion of it. It's the reason I have a job, to be honest with you. They kept me around because I was the only guy who knew how to turn on the machine that ran the BIM models. So I think what you'll see is you'll see that when things get bad, people will be looking for more ways to be more efficient, and they'll accelerate even further into this space. Very good. Tessa? I'm a pragmatist. Um, I think digital transformation is happening. It's a really complicated joke now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think digital transformation is happening, but I think the startups in the construction tech industry that will be successful will be able to uh, deploy revolutionary technologies and make them look like evolution. Uh, I, very good. I think we, it's a culture thing. Um, we're a very parochial culture. There's a pecking order by title and who reports to who. And I think if you can break that and basically be a little bit more flatter, listen to learn from the younger generations. Ask, you know, instead, you know, the more you're saying in your organization, well, that's the way we always did it, um, and pontificating about the good old days, like you're going to die off, right? Because the good old days are dead. So I think it's important. Uh, there's so much of that, like, oh, well, you're a staff engineer. You're not allowed to talk to the principal engineer and look them in the eye directly, like, God forbid. No, be more collaborative. And I think the organizations that will survive and actually thrive will be the ones that flatten out this parochial structure and actually are more collaborative internally than they are externally. So clinging to the past is a good way to cure the future. <laughs> All right. So first question here. Microphone coming up behind you. So I want to go back to the cheaper, uh, better, faster triangle. Um, and I think it's, I like to treat it as like better, which, which faster. Which they blew up consistently, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay. But, but I want to offer an alternative, which has to be better, faster, and scalable. Because if it can scale, it doesn't matter. And if it's better and faster, it should be scalable. So I think scalability is one of the biggest problems for startups in the industry because um, the diverse nature of, of construction, every project operating like a different company, makes it really tough. And when VCs, um, traditional VCs, are looking at the industry, they see the, the scaling phase of startups, and they expect, um, I don't know, like startups to, to scale like enterprise software, and it's pretty tough in our industry. So I wanted to ask you, how do you treat um, this issue? And if you have a message for <clears throat> your clients, uh, suggesting how to make this a better process. Can I, can I take this one? Please. All right, excellent. Um, so yeah, we're in that phase right now, and it, it sucks. Um, <laughs> but um, so I'll answer the last part first. The request from the clients. It's a relatively. First of all, we're we're going to sell uh, outside of the United States to s partially solve uh, that problem because it's not like the you know the way it is here. It isn't like that everywhere. Um, Japan, for example, GCs do everything top to bottom and things are highly centralized. Um, the thing that I would ask of clients here is to think about you know, how can you bring some centralized decision making to your companies um, and you know, while, while still, you know, one of the nice things about having a decentralized organization is that each project can act as a lab essentially for new ideas, which is a nice thing, but you need to find a way to bring the learnings back to the wider organization. And uh, to VCs, um, we have to educate them about the, uh, the industry and, and its problems and its challenges um, and set expectations properly. So that's what we do. Okay. Yeah, and I think from a VC perspective, we specialize in this market because we get it. You know, we're not, it's funny when startups show up and they have Turner, they have all the logos and they're doing 200,000 in revenue. Um, we understand why, right? We understand why every startup's doing business with Turner and DPR. Um, Mainstream institutional VCs don't. That's why we partner with a lot of them. My advice to startups is be super real and honest when you're dealing with institutional VCs. Like, you may have to educate them a bit. 
Um, but the last thing you want to do is take a round from them. They'll get you on the back end. Like, it's our job, right? So if you act like you're going to scale like an enterprise company, Procore is a great example. It's an 11-year startup. I mean, it, it just takes time sometimes. But I think uh, focus around solving a specific problem in some specific regions and, like, that focus becomes super important. Um, but educating VCs is very hard because we already know everything. And if we're in Silicon Valley, we know everything about everything. Um, so I think it's important that you, you just be realistic of, around the data. And sometimes you have to create your own metrics, right? The, the classic metrics maybe don't apply. Um, the 80% the solution on time is better than the 100% solution too late. And I think, um, and we, we struggled through this when we had our first 10 or 20 clients. Um, because, you know, there's the sort of 80% that basically is common to everyone and then someone will say no because they want the button in the wrong place. Um, you know, and I think it's really important to educate customers also that there are certain things that just aren't scalable because actually if, um, if, you're, if you continue to build, you know, almost customised products for different customers, you're going to fall over at some point really badly. So it's actually really critical to educate you know, construction companies that you're not just there to build, you know, you're not a cu custom software development house for every construction project. I'll, I'll probably add to that that I think our clients need to start making bets. Just make a decision and go with it. And you know what? We're making bets all day long and we might be wrong. Uh, but if you don't make bets, you don't actually get anywhere. You're just in full stagnation. If I don't make decisions today on what I think is going to work tomorrow, then I've done nothing. And I think our industry so many times is just trying to give it one more test or one more lab experiment that will last 18 months, which is longer than the average startup runway, right? So if- Stop hedging, commit. Oh yeah. So make a bet and once you've done that, deploy across all of your portfolio, no questions asked. You may have made you know, the wrong bet, but you know what, this, you know, the stakes are fairly up either, and if you scrutinize correctly, you probably make the right bet. There's really good solutions out there. Just make a pick and go with it and scale it with us. Otherwise, yeah, we'll go to Japan, right? Well, and, that, and that supports the notion before of the triangle that you defined as, you know, as cost and as time and risk as opposed, and then it's a matter of who's taking the risk um, from there. So we had another question um, here, um, and then you'll get the, oh, you, you got the microphone. and then we'll, the mic. Then we'll come back to the architect from Puerto Rico who's been using an iPad regularly yeah. throughout. So I'm hoping wireless is connected. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Hussein. I'm with AI Engineers. Most of the technologies that you've talked about today, we've actually had, we've been implementing in the last three years, or we've been starting to provide the service. Um, the problem is that for the last three years, we've been doing a lot of pilot projects, and pilot projects. And, and the concern is that, um, you know, we've done everything from flying drones and bridges for all the, our clients for state DOTs from New York to Boston. And the same thing for our 3D scans and the same thing for 3D printing or mixed reality with Google, you know, uh, Microsoft HoloLens, putting it into Unity and all that type of stuff. But again, it's a lot of pilot projects, pilot projects, pilot projects. We can't get the buy-in yet from the majority of the stakeholders, the owners. And I'm happy to know that EDC and Port Authority is taking that step because generally everything happens from the left coast to the east coast. Utah is like a thousand miles ahead of us and I'm talking about their DOTs and so forth, even in California, Caltrans. So, how do we get the buy-in to our, and I think KP, you touched on it, how do we get the buy-in from our public and, and federal stakeholders to, you know, how do we implement this, that the consultants are taking on the responsibility and the, the risk and all the insurances, but we're still at the pilot project phase, you know, how do we get the buy-in from state and federal um, stakeholders to start getting the work done. You know, it's, it's really getting frustrating because like I said, I'm tired of doing pilot projects. Me too, what's the answer? <laughs> so hopefully you're getting paid for your pilots. Because- Partially. No, no, so first of all, one, you charge a premium for pilots, which is something that startups struggle with. They're like, but they're interested, They'll, they want us to do a pilot. I'm like, how much are you making? Free. Great salesmanship, what's the commission on that? Right. Um, so I That's think it's- That's not a pilot, that's a paper airplane. Right, it's so disposable. I think it's important you know, you, you look at early adopter models. So you have to, like, you're not going to change people's minds. Like, I've tried. It doesn't work, right? And so I think it's important to, to track the enlightened people, look at their track record, collaborate with an industry to say, hey, I heard Steve over there is really into this stuff. 
um, and then charge a premium because it's not about the deliverable. It's about all the learning and knowledge. And for you to do it well and package up the learning and knowledge for them to consume and consume within their entire organization, that takes effort. That's beyond the pilot. And I think part of that is putting in a roadmap that says, here's how you should deploy it. Um, and I think that's the big fallacy, that pilots should be cheap. Pilots should be very expensive mm -hmm. because you're getting the opportunity to do something different ahead of everyone else. And you just have to be willing to do the extra work because you have to do the extra work to communicate the outcomes and what worked and what didn't work so they can socialize it through the organization. But first of all, start with the right organization. If you believe that it's more uh, transformative things are happening in Utah, go to Utah. Don't try to change people's minds. Um, yeah. our, our experience has been to stay away from any public sector procurement whatsoever. Um, <laughs> Same. So be, because I, th I think a lot of startups can die. Like we, the, the first public sector procurement thing we started in the US started three years ago and it still hasn't finished. So that's fine if you're a massive consultancy firm that can afford that, but for a small company, the focus has to be on getting customers as quickly as possible. Um, and then at some point you then flip into the public sector. Like it's frustrating as an ex-government you know, person thinking about all the inefficiencies that exist in government and how you could fix things, but unless there's a program to bring new technology into government departments, I'd steer clear, clear of it. Because otherwise um, you're waiting for that Utah Department of Transportation to present at AASHTO, and then next year they'll report on the findings of someone else who's reviewed that pilot, you know, and now you're that same three years into the cycle. Um, so while there is market maker size potential for those, um, it is, uh, it is having experienced the, the private sector selling to one or the other, def definitely different reactions and different time scales, and so expectations have to be tempered the, the same. So we're on our last question, and then we're going to, uh, then we'll be wrapping the panel up. Yes, from a few, few years ago, the Swiss, the Swiss government began to develop the, or increase the activity of robotics in every kind of ent inter in enterprise, and they have the advantage of the, the use of new technologies in their business, globally speaking. Um, but Switzerland doesn't have the unemployment rate whether we have in the United States. They, they need laborers. That's why they are developing and accelerating the activity of robots in any kind of activity of business in in Switzerland, but on the hand, on the other hand, we have the situation globally speaking. They having the advantage, having the robotics in any kind of activity. Probably, they have a better prices than the Americans globally speaking, and we have to explore the possibility to use the robotics not only in construction in any kind of activity. In my opinion. Well, it's certainly an opinion shared by lots of others. Um, that's one of the reasons why there's as much market activity as there is trying to develop along those lines. So with that, um, if you've got other questions of the panelists, when we get around to the networking reception at the end, I uh, would, would invite you to, uh, to interact with them uh, during the course of that time. But as the next panel gets ready to come up, just ask that you join me in uh, offering a round of applause and thanks very much for your participation.